Good night, mates, and welcome back to another Ground Up SCX24 build. And today we'll be headed down under to the land of Oz. And I say that because the build is going to focus around Injora's new carbon fiber kangaroo chassis. So I've got that there in the bag, but to go with that, I've got a lot of new parts here out on the mat. So we've got some Maz designs, some Acres engineering, some nice limited and colorful KTEC RC parts. Of course, we've got some Mofo RC as well, some Fury Tech. We're going to round it out with a little bit of uh, Shift RC as well. Got some nice personalized notes, some uh, freebies and new parts thrown in as well to try. And hopefully, if everything works out with fitment, we'll be running some brand new J Concepts tires got here in the back, but I think without further delay, let's get into this kangaroo chassis here, see what it's all about, see if we can't build ourselves up a little joey. All right, time to jump into this kangaroo chassis. See what I did there? So as you can see, this thing is comprised of multiple pieces of carbon fiber that kind of layer up to create each side of the frame rail. So I've got it mocked up there. I think that's going to come out looking pretty cool. Nice rounded roof shape. Fairly reminiscent of the uh, Hard Park Dementor V-Dub build. But as far as the build goes, that should be a breeze on assembly. They do provide instructions, which is a rarity in the SCX24 modification world. So they provide you everything you'll need, hardware, cross members, carbon trays, battery strap, and Velcro. It's a pretty complete package here for a very nice low price as always with Injora. So I think that is that for the frame. To get this rear jumping, we're going to need to put some legs under it. So for the axles here, I've got some nylon portal axles offered from Maz Designs. Now these aren't his original design, these are rebranded for Maz. You can also get them through Mias or Mofo RC, but I always suggest picking it up from the little guys. Um, he also offers, as you see, some additional upgrades for these axles. So I've picked up the brass portal box outers and the knuckles. Those come as a set. Picked up the CVD inners for the front, and then he sells these in a two-pack, the brass diffs with his logo. And I believe I'll only be using one of these on the build. So that should round out the axles, and I've only used these one time before, a MoFo RC version. But they're very nice, it's the complete assembly. They do come with dog bones, but you get gears, hexes, pins, everything, all assembled, ready to go. Nice free spinning, so great value there in these. Of course, you get the links, the riser, everything you need. Um, so great little package there. And then with the upgrades offered, you can just take it to that next level. But being that I've used these before, I've already kind of dealt with this brass kit and these outer covers really don't add too much weight. The knuckles, of course, do to the front. But since the wheels, and we haven't really gotten into that yet, I'm planning on using, aren't going to have brass rings, at least for now. I wanted to add in a little more brass weight. So these are from Acres Engineering. They're mini Marauder weights. It's just solid brass, and they've got the shape of the portal box. You just friction fit those over. So a nice solution to add some more low weight right there at the wheels. And since they are raw brass, you can Dremel or chamfer the edge or sand them if there's any kind of fitment issue with the fitting them in the wheel. So that's nice, very easy to customize. But that right there covers the axles. So I would throw the brass on and we'll move forward. But as you saw in the intro, I've got some colorful goodies from KTEC RC. So I think we'll go through those real quickly and then we'll jump into assembly. Bring on the color. So, if you've been following the channel, you've probably seen me post these up on my community tab. So that is where the teal blue comes from on the build as far as color matching. So these are laser engraved aluminum wheels. Custom anodized, very, very nicely done. So we will get into these a little bit more when we get to wheels and tires. But you can see here, this was the inaugural run of these guys. So very happy to pick up a set of these. So pondering the build, 
I went back to KTAC and ordered some matching teal parts. So I picked up the steering links and I got custom anodized uh, hardware here, or the balls actually, instead of being the brass color. So I got those color matched, which is a nice little option. And then the reason I said we weren't going to use that second diff cover is because I picked up an aluminum teal one. So we'll use this guy on the rear to add a little color pop. When I was on the site, they did not have a teal link riser, so I picked out a gray and I created some custom shocks, which you can do that as well. You can pick out your colors. So I've got the teal kind of body and eyelets, and then I've got the gray kind of shock ends to color match this gray link riser. But surprise, surprise, when the package arrived, he had thrown in a teal link riser as well. So that gives me some options and definitely an extra to use on another build. I had to get the uh, matching uh, transmission case in teal. And so with that, I went with a teal skid. And then that's where the second surprise came in. So when the package showed up, this arrived with it with a nice little note here. So this is a brand new flat skid part. So I'm very excited to try this out. So I think we'll sub this in because we are using flat rails. So that ought to work just fine on the build. So just a big shout out to KTAC. Big thank you for throwing in the freebies to try out. Can't wait to get these guys installed. So that's the, uh, that's the colorway choices right there. So now with that out of the way, I think we can get these axles assembled, but I've got one more piece that'll be going in those. And that of course is gonna be a little 212 Enjora overdrive for that front axle. So that should round it out. So I'm going to pick out the blue parts I need, get the axles built up, and then we'll move forward. All right, I got a little assembly progress and a few assembly notes here. So on these nylon axles, um, the upper portion of the diff cover kind of has a weird fitment. I had a problem with fitting a Little Guy Racing servo mount on the front of an axle and this rear link riser was having an issue. It just wouldn't seat uh, and you couldn't run the screws through without tilting it. So I really got to looking at the top of this and uh, the curve is flush with these flat tabs. It all flushes out at the top. So I'm looking at the plastic mount and it flushes out on the inside as well. You can see the curve flushes out with the flat spot. These aluminum ones do not. You can see that the curve sits up from that flat aluminum spot. So that is the reason they would not seat on these nylon axles. So I don't know if that's an issue on the stock. I'm assuming it's probably not. It may just occur with these nylon axles. So you can see I just took a Dremel um, sanding drum and uh, kind of just took off some material there to flush that out and kind of widen out that hump just a hair. You can see it's a little bit thinner there on the sides of where the screw runs through, but basically just tried to make it match the uh, nylon link riser that it came with. So test fitting it after a couple of sanding runs, uh, this seems to work. So I'm gonna go ahead and get it assembled back together. Another note on this aluminum diff cover I had to take my rolled up sandpaper and run that in the bearing seat to get that bearing in there. You just roll it up and kind of work it around the edges. It's a good trick to take off some of the coating if those bearings won't seat. So with that said, we're going to continue moving forward and see if we can get this axle complete. Back with more progress on these axles. So I've got this rear axle complete, got the brass outers on both sides. So it's starting to look really good. Got Utter Butter in the diff and in the portal boxes. So it's back to nice and free spinning. So like I said before, I do one thing at a time. So I did the diff first, made sure that was good. Then put on one brass portal box, made sure it was free spinning and then did the other. So I have the same theory with the front. So with the front, I did the, the diff cover the overdrive and the CVDs all at once. And then you can see I put the plastic knuckles and portal boxes back on there to test it first. And look at that, just super smooth, very nice. So now 
I'm going to do one side brass and do the same thing and then I'll do the opposite. But that's the way you want to do this. If you put it all on at once and you get binding, you don't know where it's coming from. So definitely kind of check your work as you go. So a little bit more to go and then we'll get this uh, steering link on there see what it looks like. Quick tip here I'll share with you as I'm assembling these outer portal boxes and the brass knuckles. I did this same trick on the rear as well, but these bearings are incredibly hard to get fully seated. And even fully seated, they do protrude up above the face just a little bit. But to get them fully seated as you see them here, you're gonna need more than just the strength of your finger. So what I did was back it up with a little piece of rubber that I cut off here and uh, that way you're not going to mar the surface and then you can come in and just compress them down nice and evenly and you, know, you can work it around and do a little bit at a time but you should have them all squared up if you're in that far already so it just takes a little bit more pressure to get them fully seated but that's going to make sure that these two flat faces uh, mate up here if i can actually get a hold of this guy so we'll test fit that on there, but that should sit nice and flush, and it looks like it basically is. So I'll get some grease in there, make sure that free spins, and then take a look at the other side. Okay, here we are with the completed axle assemblies, and these are looking super nice with that little splash of color there. So as you can see, I went ahead and installed the Acres Engineering overweights. And these uh, friction fit onto the nylon portal box really well on this rear axle, so no issues there, just sliding those on. On the front, they did not because the, uh, I guess the brass is a little bit smaller, so you can kind of see a gap through there to the weight. So what I did to counter that and get a good friction grip there was cut some little strips of this black tape, and I just wrapped that around the outer edge of that portal box. So you can see it there, you can see a little on the top there. But that gave me just enough extra width to get a good friction fit for both of those guys. The next thing would be the steering link. It worked out perfect. So if I square up the drivers, I've got a little kick out on the passenger. If I straighten it up, I've got perfect toe out that I was looking for. So that is awesome, right out of the gate. And then the last thing I'll repeat, do not over tighten these portal boxes. You can bind those up super easy. Do them one at a time because that's what you want in the end nice and smooth so i think that completes both axle assemblies here um, minus the servo tray and servo so it looks like that may be the next thing we address it is about time to add some directional control to this kangaroo and for that i have chosen the nano m servo from shift rc not only for its speed and prowess which is just incredible as you see there but also for its animal attraction and natural good looks. And since this is a chassis build, the servo will be on display front and center. And I thought this white graphic case would go really well with the white etched lines of the uh, wheels. And I also picked up an item I did not know existed, their matching micro servo horn for this guy. So that is super cool to round out the look and to top it all off, I've got a nice personalized note from Shift RC. It's always great doing business with the smaller companies. You get a nice little personal touch like that. So big thank you to Shift RC. And of course, we'll be mounting this guy up to the Roo with Mofa RC's aluminum best servo mount ever. It's got the adjustable posts just in case we need to move that servo forward or backwards. And with that said, let's get this stuff installed. Servo is in and wow, that is just gorgeous. So you can see I leave the servo horn off until I've got this thing adjusted. So it's just a good little reminder so I don't accidentally put the battery in and kick those axles one way or the other. So I think now with that complete, it's time to move on to the heart of this kangaroo, if you will, or the power plant. And so for that, I have Mofo RC's little Nano Bam 3200 kV brushless motor and we'll be using his transfer pinion standard mount here that'll put that motor right there in the stock position very low. 
And then I've got some hardened steel gears from OFORC, some Fast Eddie's bearings, and of course, we'll be putting that in some matching anodized teal aluminum. So I think I've got everything here for assembly. So we'll get this together and then get to testing it. All right, let's do a quick update here on where I'm at as far as this assembly. So this transmission case has been giving me a little bit of an issue here. So what I found was when I just snugged up all four of these screws, nothing would turn at all. And you can see I've got it nice and free spinning here. So what I did to solve that was, uh, you know, of course I had them all tightened down, nothing was working. So I backed them all off the same amount and would test it. So all of them a half turn and test it till I got it free spinning. Then I went around one at a time and would snug one up and see if that made a difference. And what I found was the top two were the offenders. So basically I put some Loctite on all of them, but once I had these tightened down and set up, I backed the top two just out a few turns until I got it free spinning and that seemed to do the trick. So I'm not sure what the deal was. All the bearings seemed seated fully. Coating looked fine, so maybe it's just a tolerance issue with that case. But anyways, I think before I get into installing the rest of the components for the motor and kind of go through that, I think I want to get it on the skid, mock up the chassis at least to a point, and do a quick test fit just to make sure everything will fit moving forward and there's not going to be any issues. Looks like we have the beginnings of a kangaroo here. So I've got this chassis mocked up here. So I want to go over a few things about this chassis. Um, first of which, this outer window piece here, you can see it obstructs quite a few of the uh, shock mount options. So I think for me, that's going to get cut away. It's, uh, it's not needed. You've got this full piece bracing if that goes away. So I think I'll take out that little chunk on each side to give me all my options here. So that's kind of a weird design flaw. Uh, the second is there are no link risers for the rear, which this seems like that would have been a good spot to uh, add a few in. Um, you can see this thing is really only set up for your standard brush motor. So that's one of the reasons I chose that standard mount that keeps the motor tucked. Um, to hopefully keep it all under this low plate here because there's no roof, there's no underside to mount anything to, so you're really going to have to make use of both of these trays. So for me, I'm thinking electronics here, I'm thinking battery here for that weight up front. So that's kind of the, the chassis, another kind of oddity. They give you plenty of hardware, but according to the instructions, they don't give you the right hardware. So you get a ton of 10s, but they call for a lot of 8s, and they didn't give you enough 8s. Um, I don't think they gave you enough 6s either. I believe they even call for some 5s. Um, they do give you a couple of 12s, which is correct. You need, I think, a couple down here at these uh, points that get kind of widened here with an extra layer that go through your links. But... Uh, not a big deal. I've got plenty of hardware on hand, so no problem getting it together. They do give you some little spacers and micro nuts. So as with anything, I suggest always having your own hardware on hand. I really don't count on any uh, SCX24 product to come with the correct hardware except for Trio. They always have the hardware for everything, but everything else, I just assume something will be missing or wrong. But uh, I think that's it for kind of the overview of this thing. So I think now let's get that motor and transmission kind of assembly where it is now and see if we can kind of size it up in there. Well, we may be changing direction slightly as if that's not uh, expected on any of my builds. There's usually something that goes awry or needs to get tweaked, but uh, subbing in this flat skid, which uh, works well with the flat rails, does not work so well with the low center tray. That being a flat skid raises everything up quite a bit. And that tray is basically sitting on the transmission. And of course the motor would be hitting that plate as well. Um, everything is just way too low. I don't think you could even mount the plate 
the transmission in there as is. So something I just forgot about when using these flat skids, everything gets raised up and you can see that here, everything is dropped down and recessed from where it mounts on the rail versus this guy. So that is gonna give us a lot more headroom for the motor and transmission to this center tray. So I think that's a definite swap out there. And then another little issue that I was expecting, um, but hoping that we could deal with, is that the uh, motor and mount protrude a little bit beyond the extent of the frame. So they stick out just a little bit, and I knew that going in, but because this is layered up, I was hoping this outer layer would be enough wiggle room for that uh, motor and mount, but it does not look like it's going to be. So I believe I'm gonna have to cut this portion out on this side to get the clearance for everything to stick out. But in looking at that, it looks like the nano bam being a bam is now longer than the nano beast so it looks like that's going to conflict with this piece back here could potentially conflict with this part as well that holds the cross tray so luckily i've got a few of these no longer made nano beast 2.0s on hand so i think that's going to be the swap is to swap in this stubbier guy cut this cross rail out and hopefully clear this and just squeeze all of that in right under that tray. So that is the new plan. So I believe this is a 2800 kV brushless versus what did I say this was 3200 kV. Um, so not a huge difference, but we're going to get quite a bit of uh, length reduction with this guy. So I'm going to get the new transmission mounted up, then we'll get this guy mounted and kind of go through that. Okay, got the transmission plate swapped into the typical one. So that looks like that's going to solve the height issue. And I've got the Nano Beast 2.0 mounted up. So I think that's going to solve the length issue. We'll be able to keep this back brace and just have to remove this side brace for it to be able to actually protrude out of the frame there. But uh, in getting this guy on there, we identified one more little issue and you can see the cross tray here will not fully seat because of the wires. So the mounting options were either up with the wires or out the side with the wires. So we're coming up with those to protect them. So I think I'm going to have to take a Dremel notch out for those wires in this tray. So that should solve that issue and everything should actually, you know, be able to seat with that tray. So I think, uh, all the issues are solved. So let's get this motor actually fully installed, go through that with the uh, standard transfer gear mount. Then we'll get the frame modified and get it all in there for real. Back to the heart of this roux. Well, I guess more like a heart transplant at this point, since we've now swapped in a new motor, but we're still gonna be using the exact same mounting system. So let's go through how you're gonna mount it and what you get in the kit and what you're gonna use. So. I've pulled out the extras up above, and I've also got two little uh, pan head screws that are really short installed already. You're only going to end up keeping one of those installed. So uh, obviously I didn't use any of his hardware provided for the uh, motor mount. I use these silver button heads because I like a shallower head profile here because of this link. There's potential... Uh, conflict here with aftermarket links so i like to get a shallow head so i went ahead and matched all those in silver so i've got some extra black hardware to save for something else so to start this process you need to do exactly what i've done here you need to mount the motor up with two of these little guys and actually take like two more and just barely run them in just to make sure i've got good alignment so what i'm going to do now is actually take this one out put loctite on it and then put it back in and leave it and then this one comes out and stays out and we don't use it going forward. So then once that is in there with some Loctite, we're going to uh, actually put the spur gear on here and get this on here. So that will go 
on here just like that and you see they're not touching so that's why you get this little extra pinion gear so this is your transfer gear that's going to go right there and you can see that aligns with one of the holes there so you're going to put that in and then you're actually going to want to set the case on at this point or the cover if you will now you're going to want to take these three long screws and that's where they go so they'll go into the motor and secure the motor and then one of these is going to go through and actually be the shaft for that spinning uh, transfer gear right there and then the remaining two shorties are going to actually secure the plate on there so that's the process super easy and uh, you can see why it's called a transfer gear right there so we're going to get this installed and then we'll do another uh, fit in the frame with it modified and make sure it's all fitting perfectly and then we'll test this thing we are just about ready for another test fit but i had a couple notes after getting this motor installed so of course i installed it without having it on the transmission skid just to make sure it was free spinning and it was and then once i actually tightened these down and secured it it was bound up so again i had to do loctite on both of these screws and then once that's set up for a few minutes back those out until i got the same kind of free spin that i was getting before i installed it on the skid but uh, looks like everything is functioning just fine now so i went ahead and got the frame cut and you can see my little uh, pieces here little scrap so this is the driver's side so i just took off this back brace to open up all of these shock mount positions and the uh, tray here you can see i notched for the motor wires and then this side was the big change so i ended up having to take a little notch out there for a screw head on the motor case you can see these guys kind of stick out but not a big deal and then of course took out that diagonal and then this diagonal as well so Pretty easy work with a Dremel cutoff wheel and then a little uh, sanding drum to uh, make it nice and smooth. So I think I'm going to get this installed and we'll take a look and cross our fingers, everything clears. The transplant was a success. So I did have to do a little more tweaking to the tray fitment and I'll show a shot of that. But it was uh, just not sliding all the way forward with that motor case. So I put a little clearance in for that. Of course, took out these upper braces on each side to open up all the shock mount positions there. And then the only other little fitment issue I had was just a little bit of clearance on the back side of the frame for this upper piece of hardware on that motor case. But you can't see a cutout on the front. And I did the same for the bottom back edge of the motor. So you can see that little slot through there. So it was barely kind of kissing the frame. So I just kind of carved out a little bit on the back side, but again, you can't see it on the front profile there. So this carbon is super easy to modify with the Dremel cutoff wheel and a sanding drum. It just goes through it like butter. So not hard at all to do, but overall very happy with the fitment of this little motor. And I tell you what, I'm sad to see it go off the market. I think this NanoBeast 2.0 is my favorite motor for these little guys. You can't pack any more torque and power into a smaller little package than that and look at that it doesn't even stick out the back to foul the links or anything and this uh, standard mount is just perfect to keep it nice and low and you can see there it's sticking out the side just a hair but man nice and tucked so i think now that the transplant is a success i think it's time to see if we can get a heartbeat in this thing Time to see if this kangaroo is going to come alive. So as you saw, I got my micro receiver soldered up and ready to go. I've got a little Palm Power 180 milliamp hour 3S battery. And then of course, I'm using the Fury Tech Ultimate ESC. Let's get this guy on and give it a little test here. See how smooth this motor is. And I have gone ahead, gone into the app and made a few adjustments here.
So nice and quiet at low speed. That's the transition. We're in the high. Nice and smooth at full throttle on 3S. So that transition point is something that I can just play with a little more in the tuning on the app. But honestly, I hear it more than I actually feel it as far as the vibration. So I gotta say, I think that checks off all the boxes. It's uh, smooth, it's free spinning, it's functioning great at full power on 3S. So I think with that, we can move on to a different appendage of this uh, kangaroo moving right along. So I guess if these are the legs, then we've got to get them attached to the body. And if this is the hinge point, then these are the knees of the legs. So we've got to get some links on to get these legs attached to this kangaroo. So for those links, I've got Acker's Engineering. Uh, these are flat cut links laid out on the table. And of course, I've got way more than we're gonna need. Um, you can order these by the pairs. So I've ordered all that they offer uh, lengthwise, I believe. Um, not knowing exactly how I wanted to set this up. So what's interesting about Acker's is they base everything lengthwise off of the C10 JLU Bronco links. So I've got some C10 links laid out here and then this black one is a deadbolt rear so that the way that they set these up on the site is the u-rock links which are on the bottom are plus six and a half for the front and for the rear so you can see that they're a little bit longer than the typical c10s then they have a plus ten and a half rear which is the deadbolt and then they have a typical c10 front which you can see here got the link sitting on as well so originally i was going to do kind of a mix and match but uh, getting this and looking at it um, and knowing that I can move these bars as needed and potentially chop the nose back, I think I'm going to go more with the U-Rock to keep more of uh, an equidistance, I guess, from that uh, transmission skid. Not quite. I mean, the rear is still stretched, but not as far as this one. Um, so it just really, it changes where this skid is going to sit in relation to your wheels. So this being so light, I don't need it scooted way up front. I'm gonna have the battery in the front anyways. So I think I'm gonna go with their full U-Rock set, which is just a plus six and a half stretch from the C10 in both directions. So I'm gonna get these assembled and then we'll uh, see about getting a mock-up here. Links are cut ground smooth and assembled, so I think we can move on from there. So if the links are the knees, the other joint we're going to need to get this roux hopping is the hip joint. So I guess that's going to be the shocks. So they'll provide the muscle to get the spring. So I've already gone over these, but as I went into them a little further, setting them up, I found a couple of them were really binding up. So I had to uh, kind of take some sandpaper, roll it up, and sand inside of these two upper anodized pieces. The lower one was actually getting stuck in that upper one and it would not come back out. So the shock was getting you know, stopped short. And then one of them, the inner piston was getting hung up in the lower. So I swapped, you know, disassembled, swapped some pieces around, sanded and uh, got them all nice and smooth. So I don't know what the deal was. I'm assuming just some coating got in there, but something to check for, not hard to fix. So I've got them set up now how I want them. So I've got the gold springs, which are soft, going in the front, the silver mediums going in the rear, and the black, in this case, are the stiffest that I'm not gonna use. So with that said, let's get some assembly going. Back to a little front end progress. So let's take a look at this so far. I'm pretty happy with the initial setup here. I've got the shocks in the top rear position here. And on compression, you can see I'm not getting all the way up to the front edge of the tray with that upper link. I'm not hitting anything with that servo. Got nice twist here. Not really hitting anything with these two little pieces, but I think they're pretty useless. So I think I'm gonna chop them off right here in front of all the shock mount points. So the only way I think I can get more compression and sit a little lower with this front end 
and get to that tray is take the shock point and move it back to this window frame mount point. So that has to be there anyway, so might as well use that. And you can see I used a spacer that they provided to get the shock off of this frame piece. But if I come back to this mount point on the window frame, that will act, I think, as the spacer. So I think I can save these, move that back, and then this crossbar can stay there, or if it needs to move back a position for the battery fitment, it can freely. So it's not tied to the shock point anymore. So I think I'll do that. And uh, I think I'll be pretty happy with it. And you can see there's a lot of built-in caster to this. That servo's kicked really, really far back. And I'm really liking these links the more I was working with them. They're just super nice, really loose. Um, you can see the, the uppers have the bend at the rear, and that is to clear the lowers. So there's no conflict there. So really good design. And then the last thing, I went ahead and got the drive shaft in. Um, you can see at full compression, I'm almost touching. And then that's full dropout right there. So plenty of engagement on that guy. All that took was taking a rear C10 and a couple tries here until I got it right with the little pipe cutter and uh, got the length I needed. So I've got a deadbolt rear that I'm going to have to do the same with. So I think you're looking at what's left here. So I'm going to attack the rear and then we'll come back, see how it all works. And then I'll probably take it apart and start cutting up the frame and uh, then we'll put it all back together. Back with even more progress. So I've got the front tweaked as I discussed previously. So you can see the shock mount has moved back to that frame point and uh, remove the spacer because it's no longer needed. And then you can see I put in a center limiter rubber band there. And uh, it's the first time I was able to use one of these threaded brass and Jorah spacers. So those come with their four link kits to do exactly what I'm doing here. So usually I'll run longer hardware kind of head to head and slip a rubber band in there. But I just use their little spacer piece instead. So that gives you um, center kind of limiting there, kind of pulls everything down. but it allows it to drop out if needed, you know, coming over something. And it also allows for full twist, doesn't hinder anything. So you can work with the tension there, just depending on how, how low you want to pull that thing. But no matter really how tight you get that, you're never going to hinder your uh, side to side articulation. So it's a good way to do it right down the center. Um, one thing I forgot to mention earlier on these shocks is I took out the outer O-ring which is pretty typical on the uh, telescoping shocks. You want to take it out on that outer larger flange uh, piece of hardware there. So the shock still stays on that little ball, but uh, pretty typical thing to do on those. So moving along to the rear, you can see I've got these installed as well. And man, again, these links are just super cool. You can see they kind of jog up again to avoid that lower link. And then that also serves to avoid a longer motor. So if you had like an 050 can motor, it gives you a little more clearance right there. Of course, we've got the little stubby guy, so it's not an issue anyways. Um, and then you can see here the shock point. I ended up not using any of those four that I opened up the positions for. Um, I used my own thicker Injora spacer there, and that was to get out past that hardware head there you can see for my cross brace. So that cross brace is basically set up at the bump stop. So the shocks are at full compression and those uppers are hitting that crossbar. And then you can see again, I've got a center limiter rubber band. So this one's a longer, thicker one that's just hooked on each side and looped, but it's still uh, the same principle. You get that center tuck, but you still get the full twist. So overall, it's keeping everything nice and low there. So I think I'm very happy with this setup. But like I said, I think I'm going to pull it apart now and start chopping on the frame a little bit. And the question now to me is, do I take off this rear piece kind of past the shock mount point and just have the roof line come back and cut back in? That might be kind of cool because this piece is, again, useless back here. Got the the diff getting fully up into the frame there so <clears throat> just some options there and those are basically visual 
neither one of those really hinder anything, but uh, that's the state of the Rue so far. So I think once I come back, we'll have this thing uh, looking a little more complete. Well, as they say down under, too easy, mate. So you can see I did end up chopping that rear extension, and I think that was a good decision. I'm really digging that new roof line. So really clean, nothing beyond those shock mount points, except for the rear legs of this roof. And then of course the front end, I did the same treatment, cut it flush, got rid of that extension. And the only other tweak I made on reassembly was adding another little rubber band to that front axle with the servo on it. It added a little more weight, so I needed a little more tension on the dropout. But other than that, I think this roux is about ready to hop. But one thing we're going to need to do that are some brains. So you know what's next. Well, that had to be one of the quickest, cleanest, easiest, most convenient electronics installs I have done. Everything uh, just found a home super easy, not a lot to even accommodate there. You can see the wires under the tray there and just coiled up so nice and low. So I think while I'm waiting on this Velcro double side to kind of set up before I stick a battery down to it. I think the one thing glaringly missing here are the wheels and tires. So I think it's time to get some feet on this kangaroo. Well, here we are back at the original item that spawned the teal colorway for the entire build. And that is these KTEC RC aluminum wheels. So what makes these so special is these are custom laser engraved with topography lines, as you can see here. Those just look outstanding. So no two sets of these wheels are the same, just like with any of their custom wheels. Some of the splatter, they've got various different things they're doing with the uh, laser etching and then the custom anodizing, but just beautiful work here. Not much else to say about these wheels. They're all aluminum, non-vented rings. Pretty lightweight, I'm assuming about 11 grams. But I thought the topography lines would be appropriate for an Australian themed build just due to the varied terrain of the continent. So that being said, next to these, I've got some J Concepts ruptures, which I'm hoping to make work on this build. These are fairly new. They've gotten great reviews. They're very uh, sticky, very soft and gummy. And they're coming in at 63 millimeters. So we'll just have to see if that height is gonna work with the laid down angle of those front shocks and the CVD turning angle. But we'll get one together, get it mounted up, do a quick check. And then if we need to change course, we will. Quick test fit here looks to be a success. So you can see here, we are not touching it at full lock. And that is due to this extreme uh, caster of this front axle. You can see how much it's leaned. So it's also leaning this pivot point of those knuckles, which in turn leans the whole tire and tucks it under. So even at full compression, we are just missing it. So I think on maybe full compression on a twist, there's gonna be a little contact and there will be, so it, you know, it may not be that big of an issue. I don't think it's gonna occur that much of a time, but it's not enough of an issue to make me steer away from using these new J Concepts tires. I think we're gonna go ahead with this uh, 63 millimeter and knowing that those are gonna work I'm gonna start thinking about some alternate wheels for that other set of J Concepts tires I had on the table to start with. And these guys I think are definitely gonna get vented, potentially a foam swap, but uh, otherwise I think I'm very happy with the look so far. So I'm gonna go ahead and get the others mounted up. 
man, this thing is looking awesome. So as you saw, I did pop a few holes in the tires, get those guys vented with a little leather punch. And I swapped in some little Nova Crawl Innovations foams. So these guys feel really nice. Look at that articulation. Just nice and uh, puffed out, big donuts here. Kind of look like oversized Proline trenchers as far as the tread pattern. But uh, one other little tweak I made was swapping out the front brass hexes to some Samix plus one hexes. To give me just a little more clearance there to that shock. And uh, I think it's still going to touch on uh, like a full twist compression, but every little millimeter helps. So nice little... Uh, thing to have on hand. I've definitely used those Samix Plus Ones before. They've got me out of some uh, wheel clearance issues, so sometimes a millimeter is all it takes. But uh, now that we've got these mounted up, looking good, kind of uh, set up how I want them, I think it's time to uh, take a look at what I've got picked out for the alternate wheels. Okay, for the second set of wheels, I've got these Trio uh, Silver type B's picked out and I purchased these a while back and the only style I could find had the green ring which uh, wasn't really of any consequence to me since you can see here I'm going to be replacing the ring with some Maz Designs carbon fiber rings so we'll uh, kind of match the frame with that carbon fiber and since I bought these quite a while ago these are brass rings on these and since I'm running light wheels, I want to keep these light as the alternates. So luckily, Triel has now come out with some aluminum rings. So these are great uh, if you want to tune, you know, half brass, half aluminum, or you just, like me, have a brass set and you need to lighten it up. So <clears throat> I'm going to use some Maz scale hardware to dress these up. And then for the tires, as I mentioned earlier, I've got some J-Concepts holds here. So these again are 63 millimeter. So it looks like these are gonna work. Um, these are the same green compound, feel really nice and sticky. So I think on these, since I'm running low on Lil Nova foams, I think I'm just gonna vent these and give it a go with the J Concepts foam. So I've got a lot of screws to get in. So it's gonna be a second for me, no time for you, but I'm gonna get these mounted up. It looks like somebody made a mess here. So I've been going kind of around and around on the fitment of these J Concept holds. What the deal was is they actually measure out at a true 63, whereas these ruptures end up being more like a 60. Um, so that was really causing me some problems at full lock, full compression, getting into the, uh, the shock, especially on a twist. There was no way the tire would be turning, especially with these big paddle lugs. Um, so it got me kind of looking around for solutions. So I, of course I had some plus five hex extenders and I put those on. That pushes the wheel out so far that the whole weight is basically exposed on the inside rather than being tucked in like that. So I didn't want that. Plus you lose this advantage of not having scrub steer with the portal width. Once you add that plus five, you're back to getting scrub steer again. So. That was not the solution. I didn't need that much width. That, uh, that did in fact fully clear the shock at all conditions. But I took that off, kept looking around, and I found this old set of Millstone Max uh, overweights. So I used the full set of Millstone weight hex weights. And then these are optional overweights that slip on the back of them. So if you don't use these, you can see there's a little retainer built in and then of course the thickness of this. But if you don't use these on the kit, there's little brass collars that basically make up that little bit of thickness. So they're about a millimeter, millimeter and a half maybe. Anyways, had two of those laying around and somehow they just magically slid in and fit flush in these portal housings. So there's a little recess there at the bearing retainer. So typically that's where the hex backspacer will just slide in there when it's fully seated on the pin. But now with those in there, you can see the little backspace piece on the hex. 
So that will bump stop and hit and won't fully seat on the pin. So that basically pushes that hex out another millimeter or so. So with the plus one and whatever that is, I've got about a plus two, maybe a little more per side. And that seems to do the trick here. So that's full lock, uncompressed, and we're not hitting it. So fully compressed, straight down the middle, we're not hitting it. Let's look at an extreme twist here. Let's see if we can get this fully twisted up. So you can see hitting it just a little bit, but not bad. And it, I think it can still turn through just fine. Um, before it was, let's see, is that the furthest maybe? Yeah, before it was just, there was no way it could even turn through that. So you can see there we're still rolling. So that to me is not problematic. You know, I'd rather it not touch, but I think I can live with that. It's not going to be an issue overall. So glad I did a little test fit. Um, and of course I did all this checking with the green ring and like two screws in. But now I've got this fully mounted, vented up. And man, these may... Uh, these may come in uh, close second here to looking just as good as those uh, teal topo line ones. That polished silver really pops with this polished silver of the crossbars. I think that looks really good. So anyways, enough chat. I'm going to go ahead and get the remainder mounted up and uh, we'll see what a full set on here looks like. Wow, that is looking super aggressive. I am very happy. I was able to get these J-Concept holds to uh, work out with the lean shocks, get my fitment, get everything uh, turning at full lock because they just look super sick, super aggressive. They remind me of Super Swamper Boggers, just cut with kind of the small lug removes. You've just got the big paddles. But man, I'm very happy with this alternate setup. And that is what I love about doing alternate wheels and tires. It can be a small tweak or it can just totally transform the overall look of the vehicle. And I think we have achieved that here with these. This is definitely more of an angry roux than the uh, setup here with the big donut tires. I think with those on there, it ends up looking more like a kind of a retro style moon buggy. But either, either look, I'm very happy with for this thing. So now that we've got this set up, I think it's time to get it on the scales, see where we ended up with the build, and then see if we can't fire up this roux and bring it to life. Okay, let's fire these scales up. I figure we'll go ahead and weigh the alternate set first, since it's mounted up. Where are we sitting here? Not too bad, 5743 front bias. Looks like we're going to settle in around 362 and a half. We'll call that 363 overall. Flip over to ounces, 12.7 ounces. So let's get a little more weight up front here, see if that does anything. So it doesn't change the overall percentage. Just bumps us up a little bit heavier, 378. All right, so I'll throw on the original set of wheels and tires. I don't think it'll be much different, but we'll go ahead and check it. Round two of the weigh-in. So we've got the original moon buggy wheels and tires back on there. So yeah, about the same weight, 366, still at a 5743. So let's toss this in. 381, so a little bit heavier um, with this set of wheels and tires, but not enough to really make a difference. All right, I've got the final component that we're going to need to get this room moving installed. Got the little 180 milliamp hour Joey tucked in the pouch there right in the front. Nice and uh, low profile. So that fit in there super well, just perfectly in that tray, took up the whole space. So let's get this guy uh, turned on and actually take a look at it, this overdrive. Yeah. 
nice and smooth. Very happy with that. Look at that, almost, uh, almost stopped it and lined them up here. There we are, back to straight. So I think that was about four turns to bring it back to uh, equal. So we'll check it again and count it. Go a little bit slower here to actually see this overdrive in action. So I'm thinking this was a 23%. Trying to think back. So this is turn two. Turn three. And that's turn four. So yeah, four turns and we are back to uh, equal. So that's the overdrive. Looks like it's working. All right, it is time for a tabletop test here. Let's check out this articulation. Let's check out this slow crawl. Very nice. Just loving the look of this thing. All right, let's get both sides kind of twisted opposite. Look at that. Super nice. Some incredible flex right there. I'll creep it down. So much control with these brushless motors. Just loving that Nano Beast. Too bad that's unavailable. But the Nano Bam is a great replacement. But. As we found out, just a little too big for this build. Some nice tire squish there. Look at that, no problem. Let's just let's just go up the wall here. While we're at it. Why not? I mean, we're just climbing up the walls here. Can we get this thing vertical? Look at that. Very nice. Okay, let's hit it from the opposite direction here. Get over the mound of tires. And then we take the sheer face of the ramp. No problem for those ruptures. Climbing right up. So we get that back tire up on that ramp. There it goes. Very nice. Very, very nice. Well, crikey mates, looks like this is the end of another successful build. And I must say, looks like we have ourselves a roux. So I'm just super happy with this build. Just loving the cuts that I made to the frame. I think that really changed the overall look. Just digging the color scheme as well. Both sets of these wheels and tires look just incredible. Couldn't be happier with those guys. And man, these links are just super cool. So glad I went with these. Um, I was inspired to go with these off of my original Dementor V-Dub build. And I actually was gonna get uh, the Hard Park uh, Dementor links, but they were sold out. And uh, luckily that made me look around and I found these at Acres. And uh, they've got more, even more options in length than uh, Hard Park, I believe. But uh, just super great products there on this guy. Loving the look of the servo as well. And of course the uh, Nano Beast 2.0 and now the uh, Ultimate as well that is no longer made. That is discontinued as of this video. But uh, even still, just a great little chassis. You could build this with any number of parts, motors, ESCs, and it would be just as awesome. So I've got the uh, Dementor out here on the table just for a quick reference, quick comparison. I can get them both in the shot here. So the Dementor is quite a bit smaller overall. 
Of course, it's got a little bit smaller tires on it as well. But you can see it's got these nice hard park blade links as well. So I'm really digging those, just given such good uh, clearances. I think I'm going to start going with more of these custom links for more builds. Um, you just get much better performance out of the links overall. But there's kind of the size up. So I would say that this Enjora kangaroo chassis is kind of the uh, everyman's Dementor V-Dub, if you will. A lot more affordable, a lot more accessible than anything from Hard Park. Not to take a knock at Hard Park in any way. It's just uh, very hard to get a hold of this chassis, whereas anybody can get a hold of this one. And uh, you don't have to build it how I built it. You could definitely build this a lot more affordable. I kind of went full throttle with uh, most of the parts on here, but that's the way I do it sometimes. So anyways, hope you learned something on this build. Thank you for coming along with me on it. I hope you enjoyed it. Um, definitely was a fun one for me, especially since I've been down to Australia several times. Really love the uh, continent and the uh, people and the culture, everything about it. So definitely a fun, uh, inspired build for me. And with that said, thanks for watching.